I'm here with uh, Dan Fight of Unicorn Riot and a bunch of other projects. Uh, are you part of like any other projects that are like currently ongoing? Actively right now, I wouldn't really say I'm too much involved with active media collectives. I do occasionally, you know, throw stuff in, you know, old Facebook pages, things like that. I was involved in a lot of different media teams, which do still do a little things here and there out there, but I'm not really too busy with other group projects right now, like officially. Right. Right. Uh, And sorry, just for the audience. um, So Unicorn Riot is this, um, I guess, anarchisty media collective uh, that formed in, I think, like 2015, but really blew up uh during the course of the george george floyd protests uh last year uh, is that is that history correct well, you know but more or less uh unicorn riot it was sort of uh, aimed at being horizontally organized mm. which means that each of us takes uh, a pretty strong degree of responsibility over how things are set up and we all uh, have a lot of autonomy mm. in how we approach things and so it gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of different options about what we choose to cover and sort of mm. jump into dealing with. And we're set up in the United States as a 501c3 nonprofit, mm. which means like all nonprofit media, we're not involved in elections at all. We don't do any, you know, electioneering advocacy. That's how the law works in the U.S. Mm. And uh, so what we've been trying to do is find ways to help cover things for communities that are traditionally marginalized and underrepresented and issues that are not getting a lot of attention Mm. trying to address to some extent like that kind of sense that you know what they call like the uh the phantom public or like the power players and and then Mm. there's kind of the ignored people you know and sort of talking to them trying to get the mic out there engage with people find out what's what's going on in these with these different social issues Mm. and so in that process you know we've kind of carved out different uh beats around different subjects for example uh earlier on you know we covered the dakota access pipeline Mm. very closely that was how a lot of people got to know us we had we really worked pretty hard to kind of uh, get out there get in that environment cover that stuff and uh, we eventually produced a full-length documentary called black snake killers which you can see online for free is it like on youtube that was a large you know that's a two hour yes yes it's on youtube vimeo uh we have you know facebook instagram twitter patreon you know and so so that was a full-length project that was a, a big undertaking for the the folks in the group that made that and so then yeah last summer during all this uprising stuff we uh our team was right in the middle of that we had been covering a lot of other cases of you know police killings particularly in minnesota with our Mm -hmm. members that are in minnesota and so it was a very organic turn of events that we ended up right in the middle of that and uh and that uh and as that unfolded that sort of brought our you know uh production to a lot of audiences that had never heard of us Mm. that were unfamiliar because obviously something huge was going on and you know typically with the media you know when there is something like a huge big popular protest going on it'll tend to be that the media will just sort of use their existing commentators who are usually kind of establishment insiders Mm. and ask them about their opinions about an uprising but they usually won't like go around uh, talking to kind of people in long form, they might look yep. for sound bites. Oftentimes, the most embarrassing sound bites yep. they can find a lot of the time, but they're not going to like let people sort of talk through where they're coming from, hmm. uh, you know, hour after hour, really. And so that was sort of, I think, part of what was really striking about what we did during that. And hmm. uh, it was very lucky, honestly, that all of our, you know, back end systems, the kind of things that I have to do to kind of help keep it running for who the reporters in the field that all of the machinery just happened to just barely work. Like we were down to our last, like, you know, video cable and stuff like that, you know, and, and it all, uh, went off about, about as smoothly as you could have hoped for covering something that was that difficult. Yeah. And so that, you know, that, so that went very far that, that made a big impression with a lot of people. So, yeah. Yeah. Just for the audience, like you got write-ups in like the guardian and New York times, um and yeah that that's pretty impressive 
yeah, and there was a you know a particularly nice little profile in the New Yorker, which was oh, yeah. also very good. So, you know, that kind of uh, it, it's always very interesting to me how and why media sources get taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, having a couple pieces out there like that really can make a difference, just because mm-hmm. otherwise people are like, "Who's this?" Whatever, you know. And you know, we we sort of. Uh, pick the name Unicorn Riot on a bit of a lark. There wasn't a deep strategy behind it, except that, you know, we kind of wanted a good name that wasn't boring, you know, wasn't just sort of this fuzzy concept. And so first the word Unicorn came and the word Riot came and we're like, okay, fine, let's do it. And uh, so, you know, to, that also tends to make people think that, you know, we're not serious necessarily mm. or or just whatever but it, it's definitely something that's you know memorable right yeah like, yeah and, yeah and it, it stands memorable. out as its own thing and and so i and so it's, it's as so i've really enjoyed over the years like i think you know there's a really uh very sweet kind of endearing degree of trust with a lot of the audience and mm-hmm. with what we're doing and and a lot of support there you know that that really comes across from folks and so mm-hmm. i think it's really appreciated that we've been able to uh hang in there year after year you know um, keeping tabs on these different issues and mm. and also we're you know we're sort of geographically spread around as well mm. um, we have you know our minneapolis folks we have uh someone in based in denver uh, i'm now down in philly so you know we're we're kind of um sort of spread out a, a fair bit kind of all over the place and so in the last uh you know in the last year uh we've tried to uh build up uh more contributing writers like we try to proceed very carefully right Mm -hmm. like because if it's a horizontal organization you want to try to have an organized process try to plan things out carefully so everyone's on the same page and so we've been able to uh bring in contributors from other countries Mm -hmm. we've had a, a number of pieces come in from you know from greece and brazil and some other you know distant locations during this covid pandemic about uh you know different social issues in those places and so i've really enjoyed seeing that kind of take shape and kind of working with those folks and sort of uh as they go out and talk with people in their areas and so that's given us a nice kind of uh international flavor to things as we sort of check Mm -hmm. in on things because I think especially in the United States, uh, international coverage can be really weak in general, yep. Yep. you know, and I think that, uh, you know, f- folks, whether it's in the activist world or the left, you know, they're always very curious to kind of hear about what's happening mm-hmm. in other countries and it doesn't always come through. And so yeah. I think that's one kind of cool thing we've been able to kind of get rolling in the past year. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No, especially with, um, like the massive wave of worldwide protests that we've um been seeing in recent years and, uh and also like the communication and like the sort of you know spreading of information between different protest groups uh my my favorite example of this is how in um like uh like hong kong uh thailand and uh some other southeast asian country um you know like people were like sending each other like you know pdfs for like how to do various you know protest things yes or like you know i think i think like the name bubble tea alliance um of these various groups and i i don't know like how (laughs) strong that is but um like that that sort of thing is like really crazy uh and inspiring um and so yeah when things cross pollinate right because yeah no it's a great it's a great point really um you know i've definitely seen a bunch of material like that you know people talk about you know you put a traffic cone over the tear gas and you dump a bunch of water down into it or potentially mud or or something like that you know to kind of neutralize that chemical weapon because the reality is that in our research like because we've covered Mm protest movements and what the state does to protest movements especially in the u.s so closely you'll see the same uh technologies uh, used at protests not only all over the country but all over the world yeah yeah, yeah. and um before unicorn riot 
back in you know back in 20 uh 2009 when i was at the g20 in pittsburgh mm. and that was the first time that the lrad sound cannon mm. had been used that you know piercing shrieking noise mm. uh a friend of mine who spent a great deal of time in palestine in the late 90s mm. uh you know had recognized it because that was where it had been used first you know and yeah. so all these technologies to control yeah protests and uprisings and riots and stuff yeah. those all move internationally yeah, and so yeah, what yeah. we see is that the people's movements out there also kind of share knowledge about these things as well yeah no that's what i was going to go to next is like there's this i don't know it's like um parallel evolution on both sides uh all across the world uh and then uh what's the there's like a evolutionary term for this where you've got like horizontal gene transfer, I think, uh, as opposed to like, you know, more uh, familial lineages where, you know, like you have to. Sexual reproduction or whatever, like the yeah. bacterial. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. you've got like. The bacteria exchange plasmids of genetic <laughs> yeah. little I'm out of, of my information. loop here, but I'm sure yeah. if, you know, like I, I'm out of my depth here, but I'm sure if like I had the proper knowledge, I could construct a really beautiful metaphor that ties it in with evolution. But um, yeah, and no, no, it just, um, to speak more seriously for a second, uh, it seems that there is this sort of like sharing of knowledge across the world uh and that's both really beautiful but also really scary um yeah yeah absolutely and things to get international uh ter- certainly in terms of also what the far right does like you know the uh mm. not within the state but outside the state and i'll just mention that another big research project that we've worked on very heavily uh, since uh well really it goes back pretty much about five years right when there were pre- protests in Minneapolis outside of a different police precinct and, uh, you know, very far right kind of Internet weirdos showed up kind of speaking in that jargon. Mm. They were affiliated with a board on 4chan called the K board. And I, you could see that from one of the armbands they were wearing. And then just and they showed up on our live stream. They were trying to get on the live stream. And then just a couple of days later, one of those guys came and shot several people. Everybody lived, but there were severe injuries and it was really quite traumatic. And there was, a, you know, a trial. He was found guilty. Mm-hmm. But that for, for me personally, that was where it became very apparent that there, you know, was sort of a weird Internet far right that was or, oriented towards violence. And, uh, you know, f- fast forward these five years and the Boogaloo boys yep. are still affiliated with that K board of 4chan originally. Like it's still r- linked to that. And so for me, that's when the need to kind of look carefully at these far right internet people really started. And then uh, mm-hmm. a little while after that, when unite the right came around, uh, we had reporters there. Uh, our folks were down there in the thick of things at like, you know, pretty traumatic stuff like the you know the the torchlight thing that happened on that friday night and all of that stuff and so just after it ended we were able to get copies of uh the the chat servers that these people were using the discord chats yep. and so by which was on several so discord is you know used by gamers it's you know lets yeah. you post images and stuff it's kind of like irc chat but it's a little nicer i guess and so these guys have been using that heavily for this project for for unite the right to organize racist attacks and so by getting a copy of all this stuff um and then shortly thereafter you know someone was like oh let me help you make that searchable like this you know database of hundreds of thousands of chat messages and then eventually mm. that grew into its own little website, which is called Discord Leaks, which is online at discordleaks.unicornriot.ninja. And Discord continued to be used by white supremacists uh, pretty heavily. And it's still used to some extent, but I think that has sort of trailed off. But we have uh, assembled this huge database, and, and uh, that does help people understand what these guys are up to and i think it sort of shows that a lot of the far right stuff it isn't really lone wolf attacks like one of these guys might do something physically Mm. on their own but this is still kind of the audience they're trying to play to is sort of the 8chan 4chan crowd 
their buddies on the Discord server, that kind of thing. And so coming up pretty soon, there's going to be a trial of sort of a lawsuit trial down in Charlottesville. And that's coming up before the end of the mm. year. And and uh, the Discord leaks, because they kind of show uh, a, a, a premeditation mentality, it seems pretty likely that, that that's legally relevant and that these records are, uh, you know, relevant to the case. Mm-hmm. Is that is that against Richard Spencer? Because I, I remember hearing like about some um, like, you know, legal troubles he was in that he was yes he was like facing and that could potentially um bankrupt him yes yes the this lawsuit is called signs v kessler and um if i can find that's just the nickname for it is elizabeth signs versus jason kessler but there's yeah yeah. you know more defendants listed in it so it's you know there's just a whole bunch of them but i believe yes like spencer has been complaining and that was the new york times and yeah so yeah yeah uh, and, and, and sorry just just because uh like mm-hmm. uh Cri- christopher cantwell is involved right let's see yeah i've got okay i got the list here yeah so you got jason kessler richard spencer chris cantwell you're right james alex fields yep. vanguard america andrew anglin from daily stormer Moonbase holdings which is a entity that's related uh asmador which is mm. daily, daily stormer nathan domigo Elliot Klein, also known as Eli Mosley, Identity Europa, Matthew Heimbach, yep. Matthew Parrott, who's one of Heimbach's lieutenants, the Traditionalist Worker Party, uh, Michael Hill from League of the South, uh, Michael Tubbs from League of the South, the League of the South itself, Jeff Showup from the National Socialist Movement, the National Socialist Movement Org, the Nationalist Front Org, Augustus Sol Invictus, who's a creepy Florida... <laughs> proud yep. boys related guy the fraternal order of alt knights and uh a branch of the of the ku klux two branches of the ku klux klan so that's it's a lot of defendants that are wow. in the pile there yeah that's a lot of them but you know that was the point of unite the right it was supposed to bring together a huge all the different factions you know and they were there so yep yep yeah and then you know they from what i can tell like and the reason i brought up chris Cantwell is that um so there's this podcast, um, I don't speak German, uh, which, you know, you probably know about, um, which like really goes into the deep end on like, you know, all these various figures and they've, they've had like a running bit for a while, uh, you know, where they constantly just like do Catwell news because the guy is just like <laughs> constantly shooting himself in the foot. Um, yes. And like, yes, he is, you know, yeah. So that, that's the only reason I bring it up. Uh, Go, go go listen to that it's really good anyway yeah and so many of these guys they're so weird and vain and violent yeah, yeah. and indulgent and it's just yeah it's yeah. like the closer you get to it you're like how can this be for real this like it, it like if it was a movie it would seem unrealistic how bizarre yeah. their personalities are so yeah. yeah yeah that that comes out a lot and and something like discord leaks is helpful because uh you know those are top level players right mm. but to, when they try to build a mass movement it takes the second mm. the third the fourth the fifth level of guys organizing things in different areas and stuff like mm. that and so it's been that's been very helpful for everyone all kinds of you know researchers and journalists and Everyone who's yeah. trying to understand what's going on with this this far right yeah, thing, yeah, which yeah. you know, over the Trump years got incredibly intense, and it's still out there. But you know, for the yep. most part, uh, they they haven't been out in the streets as much as they mm-hmm. were, you know, two or three years ago. Much yep. to everyone's relief, with the you know, obviously in the the Pacific Northwest, I think is the yeah. worst region in the u.s for that right now and and i'm not too much of an expert of that region but yeah, yeah. Uh, i am you know relieved that it's it's not happening yes. so intensely yes. elsewhere because yes. it was you know yeah. it was an intense you know few years of this stuff and and it could come back at any time you know it's mm. it's it's hopefully people take that kind of thing more seriously you know now that the trump yeah. years are behind us like, like yeah, yeah that yeah, stuff's yeah, for yeah. real and you can't just kind of ignore it and hope it'll go yeah. away yeah and yeah. i would what yeah. i would say about the discord leaks mm-hmm. oh I, I was just like the way i kind of framed it was um the best case scenario for trump is that he'd sort of be like a vaccination against that sort of reaction 
uh, in that like, you know, he'd be bad, but he wouldn't be like an existential threat and people would get how serious he was. And so like next time something came along, um, you know, they would take it seriously and they would like try and preempt it. That that was how I always saw it. Yeah. Well, not always, but. Well, right. Because it's like, you know, former President Trump was not the world's sharpest person at organizing things, you know, but you could easily see how someone who had more Stephen yeah. Miller administrator types kind of lined up and ready to go could be more efficient at be at building more oppressive political systems and kind of leaving his mark, you know? So, so yeah, it, it, it was sort of a cartoonish variant on a worst case scenario, you could say. Um, but, but the thing was yeah. what, what we saw, you know, leading up to unite the right, what we saw in those early Trump years was that a lot of the media organizations were not necessarily framing the issue super seriously. And, you know, you might remember there was a lot of like, you know, the Richard Spencer's, the dapper Nazi and, and stuff like that. And mm. so I think after yeah. Unite the Right, it was kind of shocking to, to a lot of people's consciousness. But with the chat logs as details, it was much more feasible for the reporters mm. at the front line of this thing who did have a pretty good understanding of a mm. lot of it to convince their editors who were not necessarily taking it so seriously about how bad mm. this was because it was so much data it was like this is you know primary source this yeah, is yeah. primary evidence we can take this seriously and i think that sort of really helped sort of shift the needle on that by making data journalism of, of like such a nature mm. that um you know these editors couldn't just kind of do they're sort of like oh well you know there's problems on both sides you know like there's that's a strong tendency yep. with, you know, yeah. boomer editors. Right. And yeah, I think yeah. I, I really do feel like this helped yeah. sort of push that needle. And so I think if people out there are looking at how to get at this stuff, I, I think it's a good example to look at. And I do know like down in Australia, I, you know, I know that the Australian broadcasting company has, has tried to look at, you know, some things about far right organizing and stuff. And I, I think this has been, Mm. at least helpful around the edges to kind of draw some connections and stuff. So again, so it's international as a point it should be made is that, you know, the guys yeah. in Australia will try to link up with the guys in England and the United States. And, you know, they're always trying to sort of get in touch. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just for like a really obvious like example, uh, the Christchurch shooter was an Australian man who, you know, was radicalized on 4chan or something. I'm not, as sure as the exact details but i know like he posted his manifesto and his live stream to fortune so that had something to do with it and then you know he um like shot up a mosque in christchurch uh and so that that that's like pretty international yeah um, yeah and they yeah. and all the ones back in america were inspired by that like they you know they call him like saint mm. tarrant you know stuff like that and uh and yeah. then uh you know so they they try to create a kind of like vibe of like canonization or sort of a cultish attitude about their, their heroes and stuff. And so, so that is very international. And I think in that summer in particular, I was looking over the chronology again, there was one after another, after another, after another, they were happening in, in New Zealand, the United States. It was like, it was really a bad little sort of stretch there for like a while. And it was like, was like wow like these people are mm. really into this and that was pretty scary and i don't know if people refer to that so much like that set of violence but that was that was very extreme and uh, again that could come back at any time that type of thing so um mm. it's a, it's it's a serious social issue and, I, and i'm just glad that you know by doing um, a kind of unusual form of data journalism around those like the social scenes and the 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 spaces that were semi-private that were kind of tried to use to organize that. I I'm glad that we've been able to uh, get people's attention to how that works and sort of show them the details. And, uh, and I think it's made a, a positive impact. I and, I and I think we'll continue to see projects like this mm. making a difference. So I am glad about that. And that, and, I, and I'm glad that the folks in Unicorn Riot, you know, that we were able to pull off that project. Cause it's not easy, right? It's, it's, it's definitely a very difficult type of work to be involved in. So. Mm. especially because like um and this is a fun way to segue into talking about more organizational related things but um like right so over the uh 
during the George Floyd protests, I believe like you guys received like a million dollars um, from donations, but like prior to that, you didn't really have uh, that much in terms of resources. Um, so like, what was, uh, what was the like process of organizing, um, you know, then and then after you received this donation and like, how did that sort of, uh, how, how did that affect you? Um, cause that, that's like pretty significant. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, we, it was, it was really great to get that kind of support from, uh, a really large number of people, right? Like we've definitely had, you know, a, a number of, uh, some people that we've been, you know, long-term supporters, right. Who would, you know, once or twice a year, you mm-hmm. know, send in like a, a really big donation and, you know, talk to some of their friends who are, you know, pretty well off. And, and so, so we've had like, like that sort of set of supporters, but then, uh, and that's sort of like almost like the seed money to kind of get this thing moving, you know? And then, mm-hmm. um, and then in parallel to that, what you try to do is create a, a large base of small donors and folks that hopefully can donate regularly, you know, weekly or, or monthly or quarterly, yearly, you know, uh, and then, and then, uh, what kind of the way that I'd sort of looked at it was it was like, okay, we're a nonprofit. And in the U S that means that you get certain tools for fundraising that a regular company would not get if it's a for-profit company. And so one of those that's been super helpful is mm-hmm. called donor box and donor box makes it a lot easier to set up uh, recurring donations in a straightforward way for donors, uh, you know, we did get a, a Patreon eventually, which, uh, you know, kind of goes up and down depending on how things are going, but that's another, you know, gateway. And then mm-hmm. for nonprofits, it's also very valuable to use certain donation systems that are connected to payroll so that if you have supporters who have salary jobs in sort of big companies, like, you know, stuff like Silicon Valley or other big companies, uh, they can donate uh, yeah. out of their payroll directly to you if you're a nonprofit. And so Benevity is one of them. There's one called uh, Cyber Grants. So, so there's a few like that. And so, and it was really, and the funny one too is that there's another one called Act Blue Charitable, which is distinct from the election oriented mm-hmm. Act Blue, which is involved with election fundraising. Basically, the company there was like, okay. We have an infrastructure. We can also make it work for nonprofits as a separate entity. So they set that up. And so it was really funny. Basically, somebody just kind of said they wanted to donate to us. And then so Act Blue kind of opened up an account on our behalf. And it just sort of started on its own without really <laughs> our intervention. But what was what ended up being a big deal then that summer was there was a huge fundraiser that was you know, sending money out to like 18 different organizations, I think through act blue. And we were one of those organizations. And so, so we would just sort of get one slice of this huge, you know, group fundraiser, you know, and and that ended up actually being a very big deal because that mm-hmm. fundraiser was just huge, you know? So, uh, so all of those different channels, my big suggestion is if people get in nonprofit media, do work on setting up your different channels because when whenever something big comes down in your space, you won't have the time to go around registering that stuff. It takes a while. It's slow. Like you got to uh, keep working on your content, right. you know, so do it ahead of time. Think of it as setting up almost like mm. different tip jars in different places, you know, so that when something does come off, like, you mm. know, people will be like, yeah, I support you because, uh, you know, you got to, you know, strike when the iron is hot, so to speak. And, uh, and so, yeah, so donor box and act blue charitable and all of those, uh, made it, made a huge difference. And so for us, uh, you know, we have an, like, we have an annual budget that we try to have kind of shaped around January. And that sort of says like, okay, we're going to spend this much on FOIA requests because we do a lot of research, right? Like there isn't so many protests in the winter. So Mm -hmm. we'll send out FOIA requests and try to do investigative pieces Mm -hmm. when we know, especially in the Midwest, people can't go outside in the winter to protest as much. So we have sort of a two mode seasonal flow, you know, 
And so we have, so we have that budget set and, <laughs> um, and FOIA is one of the big departments. And, um, and, and so, you know, once we, when we raised a lot of money, it was like, okay, well, you know, we can, we can definitely get another round of cameras because our cameras are beat to hell and we can, you know, uh, like, mm. for example, upgrade the web hosting so that that can handle more traffic, you know, and, uh, and, and coming into that year, like we had probably like at the beginning of 2020, I think we only had like in our savings, like all the money we'd socked away, pandemic was starting. We had about $40,000 like total saved away in the savings and everything. And, you know, we, so we ran a fundraiser and we're like, Hey everybody, we got t-shirts and stuff. And, you know, another big tip I have for everyone is if you do fundraisers with t-shirts, try to have the, the, data for processing who to send the t-shirts to handled by other people stick to your core competencies it's great to do a lot of stuff yourself but man it took a long time to gather a lot of t-shirt info to like sending stuff out to like kazakhstan and stuff you know like it was t-shirts went all over the world in this process eventually because because we raised a ton of money and then was like oh man now we have to collect the postal addresses to send everybody t-shirts as gifts from the fundraiser. So that was a tough one to logistically figure out. So, um, yeah, but so, so coming into that, like, yeah, our resources were very limited. We all kind of assumed like with COVID, it was gonna be another tough year for independent media, which it has been, you know, that certainly doesn't help. And so, Mm. um, this uprising coming in, like, it wasn't a surprise exactly in the sense that, there's tension, you know, latent tension in Minneapolis. And so it's not a surprise that something like that happens in general, Mm. but the timing of it is always a surprise. Right. And so, uh, so with that and being able to, uh, raise more resources out of that, then we could sort of revamp our gear. Um, let's see, we, and before it, like, you know, we were, like we have, like we have an hourly rate. Like we do a lot of volunteer hours for the org as well. But but the collective has an hourly rate, and we mm. were able, we sort of slowly stepped that up quite a ways because, frankly, it was like you know it was enough money to kind of make a dent in your bills, but it it wasn't exactly like uh, enough money to you know to 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 live off of full time, avoid yeah. going into debt, you know. Um, certainly, especially in some regions of the country more than others, like it was a very tight budget for a very long time. Mm. And so, um, it was, it was a big relief that was like, okay, now we can kind of, you know, move our pay scale more up to something somewhat more approaching a professional grade. Although we, you know, we're still, uh, you know, what we call 1099 employee or we're not employees. We're, we're independent contractors under 1099, which is different in America than W-2 employees. So we don't have health insurance from this. We don't have, you know, retirement uh, from this. We, we don't have those like benefits that come with being an employee in this process. But we were at least were able to kind of move our pay scale right. more towards what is generally out there in the world of media. And, and likewise with um, the system for, for our outside contributors, um, you know, I worked really hard to kind of set a good, reasonable pay scales that were, uh, you know, in line with the industry that were actually uh, supporting the contributors enough to be like, you know, t- as a, a pr- kind of professional rate, you know, and not just like the the level we have to try to duct tape everything together because, you know, we've spent hours or so spent years at that level, you know, at, at those kind of hours. And um, so I'm just really glad that we were able to kind of like change gears up to that so then that's more sustainable right because it's been very hard right it, it's it's hard you know yeah. we've had people in the org you know whether it's trying to look after family or stuff like that you know and it is very difficult mm. uh in the media world c- commercial media or nonprofit media uh the the money has been so thin for so many years that it's very hard for people to kind of hang in there uh in that industry and so i'm very thankful that mm. we had so much support uh, from all these folks that really placed a lot of trust in us and a lot of faith. And, uh, so, you know, I, I hope we can, I hope we can live up to those expectations and, you know, keep the ball rolling and, uh, t- you know, t- develop kind of, ch- you know, challenging stories about these things, uh, keep the platform moving and, uh, 
you know, basically educate people. It's, it's really supposed to be about educational media, bringing people a better understanding of issues. And so I'm really, I'm, I'm very thankful that we have, you know, we can actually budget out years ahead of time. We can plan ahead a lot better when we have more resources. So mm. it's, I'm very glad about that because I, I sure, you, yeah. you never know if it's yeah. going to happen. It, it's totally a roll of the dice. Yeah. Um, so speaking of education, um, do you have like any, you know, stories or anecdotes of um, like people you reached and like changed in a pretty profound way? That's a good question. One thing that I think is particularly sweet is that there are definitely parents out there that like huh. to kind of play certain unicorn segments for their kids and stuff. Like they want their kids to understand the issues and start to understand right. what's what's going on in the world. And, you know, because like kids get exposed to so much dreck through corporate media and stuff. And so mm. I actually thought it was actually very touching that sometimes these parents are like, yeah, this is great. Like, you know, my kids have been watching this stuff and this is really cool. So so that's that's like one specific little audience that I thought was particularly sweet. And, you know, it's interesting because we really do have these different segments of audiences in different places in the world. Uh, we, we have a bit of an audience um, just just in Greece because we've just done a number of different stories. Our folks have been to Greece a couple times. Um, my colleague Nico is uh, from a you know Greek American family, and so so we've so we have had kind of a, a Greek audience uh, develop in particular as as one example. And, uh, you know, with the Brazil stories, we start to see a little more, uh, you know, Brazilian audience develop. So I'm trying to think, um, I don't have a great anecdote off the top of my head right now, uh, but, but I would say, you know, that it's, it's, it's definitely been appreciated when, um, you know, things like Standing Rock, for example, like yeah. our, our group was the, you know, the first media group to really go out and do video at any events. Like when Standing Rock was very first starting and the first events were happening, we were basically the first people to kind of, our group was the first group to come out there and do any of that stuff. And so that was, like that had a, a really nice solid impact with folks. Um, mm. One one story that, that I did went surprisingly far. Like I did a, a, a few stories about different uh, data leaks that, that kind of came out sort of, hackers would get huge amounts of information or or other sources or people that weren't hackers might get information and then it would find its way to uh this other group distributed denial of secrets and yep. a few times they hit me up and said hey dan you know we've got some interesting stuff here um one of those was uh the the 29 leaks which was about uh corporate registrations kind of shell companies being created in london and another one was about the Grand, uh, basically a bank in the Cayman Islands had a branch um, in uh, either Jersey or the Isle of Man, you know, one of those offshore British jurisdictions. Mm. And it just got all of its stuff exposed. And um, so those two stories, they came out pretty close to each other. And, and I thought it was very interesting. Those stories actually went really far and people were very interested in it. Um, the... Uh, I believe the the Cayman one was run by this person Phineas Fisher, or, or Persona, mm. you know, who sort of a uh, who done who had been you know named as the person doing a bunch of other sort of similar you know hacks against the power structure, and mm. so I you know I was just I thought it was very cool to see that that story went really far. I thought that was very interesting. I just that was kind of a quick one because everything just sort of came together really quick. Um, and I was, I was just really happy to see that like, like that particular story really got out there. And, and so, and then another thing too, is that like, um, what happens th th we have this whole other kind of track, like I said about, uh, you know, police violence and what happens with when police kill someone in a family, what happens to like the mm -hmm. mothers and the cousins and the sons and daughters and the parents and all the people around that have like a hole cut in their family from, you know, state violence. And so yeah. that's one thing where, you know, so, right. And, and so, um, so folks in our group have built pr pretty deep relationships with those people. And then those <laughs> folks 
will then, when there's another incident, those folks will come and sort of help those families, you know, from people that, you know, happened to earlier. So there's like this sort of continuity. There's kind of a community there. And so, um, you know, we, we've done a number of things like, uh, you know, streaming. They have like an annual dinner where they, you know, sort of get together, talk about the family members that they lost and stuff. And so that's a very, you know, personal connection because it really, it, you know, it really means a lot to those folks to just uh, to have um, their family members kind of memorialized and kind of put out there and say, hey, like this happened to my family. This didn't become a famous incident like George Floyd, but, mm. you know, it had these things to it that are really relevant and you shouldn't forget it just because there wasn't some shocking video around it like we shouldn't forget it, you know? And, and yep. so, um, so we've really connected, I think quite a lot with, with those folks. And, uh, and, you know, I think they really appreciate like sort of, um, giving some just sort of care and attention to like how that happens because it really does happen in, in the United States at a very high rate. It really happens a lot in this country. Mm. And so, um, so I just think that it's been really great to sort of, you know, have that connection with those folks and sort of, um, you know, when those folks come back around or they're at events, they can sort of, again, have a time to sort of like talk for a few minutes about sort of, you know, what happened with their case and kind of like, uh, you know, keep that thread going basically and not don't mm -hmm. just let it kind of get, you know, lost in the shuffle. And so I, I think that's definitely um, an emotionally salient yeah. thing that unicorn riot has worked on for years and years and years which led so organically into everything that happened with george floyd like that was yeah, part of the yeah, reason yeah. why there was trust with us as an organization right, that we were right. going to try to get it right as much as we could that there was like a good yeah. faith kind of feeling around yeah, that wow. and that was very important so so it didn't yeah. come out of nowhere it came out of that in particular wow. and how you talk with people yeah. about things like that how you deal with the emotional levels of that so that's a very important thing um and and i think probably the most yeah continuing like emotional theme that i can think of at the moment is that type of thing yeah 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 wow i i didn't even know that that was um <clears throat> that was part of the whole dynamic uh, around that uh, that incident. Yeah, and I'll add, sorry to interrupt, but I'll just add quickly that we are working on a longer form documentary, which is called, the working title is The Mother's Documentary, sure. The Mother's Doc. And so we are working on a long form piece that has a lot of interviews. Yep. Uh, and I shouldn't say too much about how far along the production process is yeah, at yeah, the moment, yeah, yeah. but a lot has been done. It is yeah. actively happening. It, it, you know, it got slowed down because of the uprising, but it was already started before the uprising. <laughs> so, yeah. so okay. we were already deep in the process. So, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty good reason to um, stop working on a project like that. Yeah. Wow. All right. Shit. I didn't, um, I didn't expect it to go. I didn't expect our conversation to go like anywhere near there, but um, that's, that's really cool. Yeah, and it's just it's just kind of kept again happening one one time after another, and it's something that uh, as we go out to cover things, it all feels very close at hand. Like uh, you know, they the the parents and they know our reporters and, and stuff like that. So it's just something that we just sort of return to kind of touch that base uh, pr pretty frequently. Yeah. Um. Yeah, yeah, no, because um, like one thing I can like you know, last year has kind of been a blur for me. Like I think a lot of people. Yes. But one thing I can remember like pretty clearly were you know these like um, interviews uh, done by Unicorn Riot of like people, and you know just just how like intimate they seemed, um, and you know how kind of utterly unlike anything on like corporate media that was, and uh, yeah. Like mm -hmm. now that you've given me this broader backstory, uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, like why you could, uh, like do something like that. So yeah, c congrats. Like that. That's oh, thank you. Um, but you know, it it's like you can't build that rapport out of nowhere, right? Like it does take time. You know, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a it's a real process of sort of building that trust with people, and so um, and and that that hasn't been my main project personally in the process, but I've tried to like, you know, support mm. that sort of, you know, whatever's kind of needed around mm. 
that process. Yeah. And, and, you know, so it all sort of adds up. And, and then so that's yeah. why when we talk to folks like those parents and stuff, it's just sort of like, OK, we're now we're like catching up like there's already a position of trust to start from instead of just being like, who are you? Which might be the case with a, a different organization. Yeah. All right. Wow. Um, okay. So I think, uh, I think we're going to switch gears a little. And I'd really like to talk about Occupy now, um, especially because, you know, it's 10 year anniversary. I'm just going to throw that in there. Um, Cause from what I can tell, like you, this whole thing kind of got its start with um, like, well, not got its start, but you know, you can really sort of trace it back to um, Occupy. So uh, can, can you like sort of lay out like, the steps there then i guess sure so so unicorn riot as an organization you know that started you know well after occupy that was like Mm. you know we got moving in like the spring of 2015 and occupy happened in 2011 carried over to 2012 and 13 and so what so i had earlier uh you know i had this career after i got out of college i i worked at uh as a reporter at the Minnesota State Capitol. And then in 2007, when the Republican National Convention was coming to the Twin Cities, the next year, 2008, I I joined up with Twin Cities Indie Media, which was a chapter of the Global Mm -hmm. Indie Media Network, which, you know, started around the WTO protests and had, you know, uh, independent chapters all over the world. You know, some of the chapters are still going, like Athens is still going, I think, you know, um, but it was it was a pretty big network. It was like kind of the first place where you could upload your own protest photos and stuff like that. And it was really kind of a breakthrough for its time. And so mm. uh, I came in the process. I came to know people that, you know, some from New York, some from elsewhere, and they were trying to do other types of independent media stuff. And so we from 2008, we whipped up a documentary called Terrorizing Descent, which was a funny so, you know, collaborative project about what was happening in the streets and the RNC. I believe the website is still up right now, terrorizingdescent.org, if you want to see it. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a four-part documentary, and each of the four parts is kind of distinctly different because they sort of had, you know, a little bit of different visions, right? But we got the we got the documentary done in, like, you know, seven weeks. We got it done between September 4th, the end of the RNC, and the election in November. We cranked it out. And, and so that was, um, it was just a, it was a cool experience to kind of, um, you know, develop the interviews and sort of clean up the footage. And it, it you know, it was a very tumultuous and traumatic thing. The RNC, it was very strange. There was, mm. uh, you know, FBI informants like in the, in that two year span, I, I ran into at least four different people that were either agents or sent by the FBI just in the twin cities, you know? So it was a really weird tense time. And it, and they actually kept using one of the informants like the next year in the first year of the Obama administration, this woman, Karen Sullivan infiltrated the anti-war committee. They tried to, you know, do grand jury raids and stuff that spring of Oh nine. So it was really a two year thing. It was very strange. Um, and then in 09, like, yeah, I went out to Pittsburgh for the, the G20 summit, uh, with Pittsburgh Indie Media, they hosted us and we got a lot of the same people together, but we had, a um, we weren't doing live streaming, but we had a better method of like ch- churning out video clips quickly, kind of like trying to like mm. encapsulate different viral things that are happening. If you've ever seen like, you know, a picture of a truck that's blasting an LRAD, like shot up from pretty close, you know, that was one of my colleagues that kind of became the ultimate first American LRAD video clip and that went everywhere. And so that um, so we had a better system and we could do a mini documentary just in a couple of days, much quicker um, mm. because we had a better system. And then so in 2011, um, I had learned how to run the livestream.com platform, which is originally called Mogulus. People want to know the arcana of defunct platforms. And, and so I had learned earlier in the year working at this thing called Netroots Nation, which is a mi- mainstream liberal thing. I was just working on the video team there. Mm-hmm. And then my friends in New York were like, hey, Dan, we're going to be at this Wall Street protest. Can you help run the video channel system? And I was like, yes, I have the experience. I know how to deal with the system. I, just, I 
know it very well. Mm. And so I thought it would just be a cool project for the weekend, a good time to practice how to do this media stuff. And then that blew up into Occupy Wall Street, into this, you know, huge thing that went on and on and on. And so we had to, uh, you know, build up these systems and sort of, uh, it was actually, it was my idea to put us, uh, to, to create a Occupy Wall Street uh, IRC chat channel using the indie media chat servers. And people gave me some credit because they're like, okay, good. That's not a shady IRC server. That's good. Um, and uh, so, so it was it was very amazing to kind of be involved with that as kind of this remote media person and then watch it like spread across the United States and all these other cities and other countries and move along very quickly. And then I was able to get out there uh, within a couple of weeks and sort of, you know, start doing more stuff firsthand. And we sort of, you know, set up a media center and all of that. So it was all it was all very ad hoc. Right. It was all just mm. like, OK, you know, day to day, like, what do we need to do? You know, it was it was not the most uh, carefully planned uh, media project for sure, but it was very effective because we had uh, a whole system for you know carrying around laptops connected to webcams. Uh, we were literally taking like buying old Dell laptops, taking the keyboards off, putting in slightly better CPU chips upstairs from the media center on a table so they were just fast enough to run the video system. And then, you know, image them and then turn them out and get them ready, mail them out to other cities so other people wow. could have media kits. And we were just kept turning those around and sending out media kits to people totally like stapled together like that. So um, so that was a big deal. That became kind of the default pattern for how the Occupy camps would run their channels. And then this that, that media project was called Global Revolution or Global Rev Live. Uh, the Facebook page is still live, you know. Um, but uh, they, they Twitter swept our Twitter account in one of their nasty little purges a few years ago. And so, so that project was very ad hoc, but it had a lot of good things about it. And it did reach a lot of people. And it was you know, kind of similar to the things we do years later with Unicorn, talking to lots of people about why they were involved in this. Like, why was this such a huge thing all over the world? Why were people coming to camp out in these parks, talk about mm. problems with capitalism and, and sort of protest and you know fighting the financial system fighting other social problems and i you know i found that very appealing i was like yes you know like we're actually like chipping away at this you know neoliberal consensus like put up with all the stuff the corporations are doing like it seemed like we had really good traction there for a good amount of time and i think that out of that you know lots of different people became inspired you know i heard from a lot of people who felt they didn't know what they wanted to do with their life. They felt really down or suicidal or whatever. And this kind of thing gave them a new purpose because they felt they could work with other people on, on lots of different types of things. And, and so that was so that was very encouraging and um, to, to create all these different live streams. And, and honestly, we actually had a decent relationship with the people who ran livestream.com because they could see that they were getting tons of new, new users. Like it was getting their service out to the world, you know, it was getting them <laughs> out and noticed. And it was kind of funny because they started giving us the free, uh, like pro channels. We just had to ask for more like pro channels and they would give them out because they didn't, none of their advertisers wanted to be on the channels, right? But they still wanted everybody's attention. You know what I mean? And so we were just like, okay, we get everybody pro channels wow. for free. Yay. <laughs> like that was That's a so funny, funny arrangement. And um, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. And so, um, so there were a lot of positive lessons there and a lot of like, you know, attempts to kind of like say, Hey, this is about equality. This is about, you know, challenging capitalism. This is about mm. horizontal organizing. You know, it was very friendly to like the anarchist style way of, of looking mm. at the world and organizing and stuff. But it was pretty open tent, right? Because you had greens, you had a lot of different kinds of people, f you know, for better and worse, right? There was a yeah. lot of different p types of people involved, but it was good that it wasn't just like the spokespeople. You know what I mean? Mm. In every big movement, there's going to be people that are probably more career ambitious oriented who want to be the faces yeah. of everything. And what was nice about this was it was like, Hey, you know, we don't have to always talk to people like that. We can talk to these regular people and just get around and see what's going on and just engage with people and, 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 and sort of uh, avoid the kind of 
management nonprofit stratum that like afflicts things a lot of the time. And so, and so those are, I think a lot of the positive lessons that we could take from that. And we were also like, uh, when the NYPD, you know, trashed our stuff and everything, like, when they cleared out the camp in November, we were able to get a major legal settlement and that also, hmm. uh, or not made, you know, not massive, but you know, enough to replace a lot of gear and kind of, you know, pay to sort of help keep other media teams going. And my colleagues back in that organization were, were really good at organizing media teams. And so like they went off to like, uh, you know, uh, Gezi Park and the, and the Turkish protests and stuff like that. Yeah. And yeah. trying to kind of keep the ball rolling, keep trying to do similar things like putting together media teams of like, you know, young people that like have some interest, but maybe not all the skills they need and just train people up as much as possible. I thought that was really, really admirable and, and cool. Um, and so, so, so then later, you know, um, some of our other folks who had been involved in this then went and did stuff. They they went and did like media stuff at like the tar sands blockade or other sort of mm. anti pipeline protests that were going on. They tried doing, you know, video footage at that. And we were sort of just, and I was just sort of sitting there observing that being like, okay, like this is cool. Cause we're bringing in live video from these other types of, of protests that are out there in other places. And so, um, so from that thread, from the Occupy thread, from some other, you know, kind of s sources of inspiration and method, uh, then we started, uh, some of us start, started having more conversations. And so from those multiple types of sources, that was sort of how Unicorn Riot came about. But we all sort of went in with the understanding it would be organized very carefully. Like mm. the process would be very specific. It would not be so ad hoc every day yeah. and organized more yeah. carefully. So that was the thing we also took from Occupy and the stuff we did back in that day was we have to do this a little more formally if it's going to work sustainably we have to be a little more organized about how we do it sure so i yeah, guess that's yeah. how i'd put that yeah so one of my uh, other guests um richard bartlett who is a new zealander his like coming to radical politics was through occupy and he actually had like a similar sort of experience in that like he was very like sort of aimless and didn't know what to do and then like this thing came along and, you know, it was like this big, beautiful mess, but um, it really gave him a lot of hope. Uh, and like from that, he could sort of find a direction in his life. Um, I think there's like a limit to that sort of thing. Like, you know, you, you certainly don't want to go down the ro road of like the 1960s where like, you know, everyone just like drops out of politics to get into therapy. But like, um, I also, you know, I also think like the emotional stuff is like pretty important and um, yeah. So like not ignoring that uh, and, and reaching, trying to reach people through that is also important. Yeah. My view from having observed this stuff kind of ebb and flow over years is that I think it's, it's very important to have some level of kind of political ferment that mm -hmm. is happening outside the channel of elections. And, you know, this is yeah. my personal opinion is that as long as that kind of backdrop is there, then the political outcomes are usually better because what was going on before Occupy in the United States was the Tea Party being mm. organized by huge dark money entities like Freedom Works and Americans for Prosperity and stuff like that. And those guys were the only kind of visible rabble whatever even though it was you know to a great extent very astroturfed from yep. these big well well moneyed conservative shops right and yeah. so if that's the only thing that's on the scene then politicians will kind of bunker down and sort of t start taking their cues from it and be persuaded in that direction and so by having something like occupy come along or the other you know in 2011 internationally there were a lot of other protests in like the squares right earlier yeah. in 2011 spain you know around the mediterranean egypt you, you know like a lot of places had these protests in the squares and so occupy took a lot of uh 
in organizational cues from, mm. especially from people from Spain. And, and so all of that, you know, um, it doesn't necessarily like translate one to one into like formal political power mm. in the halls of, of the government, like neatly, but it does affect the backdrop. It does train people up. It does encourage them to, to take action somehow and to be involved. And then maybe even after that moment or that phase f- fades away or that window kind of closes, those people still have a battery of experiences that they're drawing yep. on that they may then take back to their own, back to their own community doing stuff, you know, like fighting the local coal mine or, or, or fighting against what the, you know, police policies or, you know, gentrification or, yeah. you know, a number, any number of different directions. And sometimes that is in like an election, you know, kind of more establishment channels. And sometimes it's still way outside of it, you know, and sometimes it's just, training the next generation right and so 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 to me it's like whenever these things are kind of out there and moving and that energy is out there usually the the way it it does affect how things shake out because these broader networks do affect how people think about things and i think occupy is kind of famous for introducing you know the one percent lexicon yeah yeah. right And, and changing it to be like okay yes america has radical wealth inequality problems it has serious problems with its finance and banking systems and 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 you need a new way to think about that that isn't just right-wing tea party austerity cut all the social programs you know you, you need a different alternative way to think about that stuff and then that in turn in my experience you generally politicians will take a path of least yep. resistance yep. and so if there's no resistance from the left then they're going to come down against what the left wants you know but if there's a ton of resistance on the left to a lot of different things it'll it does move the needle and it's not always satisfying because the needle may not move very much but usually the meat needle does move a bit and i and and sometimes it moves more than you expect yeah, it yeah. does and so i and so that's why i think that you know these 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 movements and and uprisings and and mass assemblies and stuff like that all that kind of stuff does make a difference as to how things shake yeah. out so yeah. I, I think it really does matter quite a lot and and so with the media stuff you sort of turn a a, a kind of circuit right because you're showing people other consciousness uh, or, or you're with the viewers the audience like they're they're hearing what other people are saying and then that motivates them to be like oh i could do this too like this yeah. isn't unfeasible for me to be involved in this and the media project the broadcasting is that sort of in between like part of the circuitry i honestly to me honest it's interesting i think that like especially with the audio from Occupy Wall Street, when our rigs were collecting the sound, mm-hmm. the kind of murmuring that was going on. I think that honestly, I think that people have probably a deeply seated pattern in their consciousness about kind of the murmuring of crowds, mm-hmm. you know, like it sort of actually strikes an interesting chord, you know? And I think that that alone, that sound, not even the visual, but mm-hmm. the sound to me is actually surprisingly powerful and i think is has an influence on people like okay there's crowds of people out we can assemble we should talk we should do you know so i I, that's just part of that energy there that i think actually is a very strong pull with people so yeah i think uh i think i absolutely agree i i i also um i also just want to like contrast that with um like the electoral route um so i i think I think while there's like some things that about like electoral organizing, uh, that like, you know, like people who do that definitely gain skills and they definitely like build contacts and stuff, but, um, it's like far more one, one, like the space you're operating within is like far more restricted. Um, uh, two, Mm -hmm. it's like far more mapped out because like, you know, if you if you win like you can get a lot out of it and so like you know a lot of people have just invested a lot of time and money into like figuring out all the tricks so it's difficult to come up with something new and then finally it's like very all or nothing like either your guy gets in or he doesn't uh and you know you can make you can make claims like oh you know like but 
you know, if we get like 49% of the vote, you know, that means they'll have to take us seriously because they want to get some of us. But like that, that's like far more, that's, that's like a form of power. That's like far more nebulous than like actually having someone in. And also those people aren't like, yeah, like voting isn't like that it doesn't like show that much commitment. Whereas like people, you know, like getting out and like being in a place or like protesting or something that, that shows like uh, a lot more commitment. Um, And so, you know, they, they just kind of have to take it more seriously. Um, And, and I think uh, I bring, I bring all this up because I think like the current, like, uh, I think one word that you could use to describe the mainstream socialist left in the United States, the the one that like kind of seeks formal legitimacy, I think, I think is like, uh, not like, like the, this sort of like had like mood swings over like the last, uh, four or five years. Uh, and it's yeah. like, you know, basically tracking to how well Bernie Sanders is doing. Um, and um that i think i think that's like a really i think it's like just you know and and obviously if my politics like duh of course i think it's stupid but like it 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 just seems like even if you know you're approaching it from a more like quote unquote pragmatic although i don't actually think it's pragmatic but whatever uh position it's like you're kind of like leaving a lot on the table like you're not, you know, you're, you're never going to be able to like outspend people in these areas. Um, like you, you, you know, you should try and do like sort of going back to, you know, uh, uh like, like, so the, re- the reason, like one of the reasons like unicorn riot, right. Uh, can like have these like, you know, really personal conversations with people in this community when, you know, like shit like riots is going on is because, you know, they actually have the time and capabilities to build up like these relationships with these people. Um, and that's like, that's something that like big corporate entities just can't do. And when you're like engaging in electoral politics, mm-hmm. uh, I don't think, and and maybe this is, you know, just like the left in the United States is like kind of new. And so it doesn't really know what it's like. It's like, hasn't just gone through the process of figuring out strategy but like it seems to me that you know you should like try and take an asymmetric approach where you know you focus on areas where you're really strong and where your opponents are really weak um and like electoralism doesn't seem like that to me um just because like you know like like one guy you know who has like read all of marx and has like very very like strong opinions about like the value form his vote matters just as much as like some dude who like right. you know saw like a video of donald trump like shooting in the like shooting with like an eagle in the background and thought he was like pretty cool and like went to vote right right yeah well i would just say like I, you know i i do keep an eye on it as a. Uh, like I said, you know, as a long time, seriously unreformed politics junkie on, on sort of the ebb and flow of these right. things. And when I was living in, around Boston, what I saw was that the left had a hard time, uh, you know, the left is going to have a harder time getting people that it likes to win a primary or a statewide election or maybe even a seat in Congress. But they can Mm. form some alliances with some other groups and get some kind of buy-in going in both directions. And for example, help support a reformer getting into the district attorney in Suffolk County, which is in Boston, who announces beforehand that they're not going to, that they're going to do the opposite of what's called broken windows policing of like throwing the book at people Mm. for minor things, for example. And so that uh, Rachel Rollins, and that really upset the traditional white power structure in Boston because Rachel Rollins did win and definitely was a huge break from the, (laughs) the very locked in place Boston power structure. Uh, and so that, yeah, 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 so, yeah. so I think that like the left, uh, folks like, you know, d- 
DSA, Democratic Socialist America or whatever. Um, certainly around Boston, there was like, you know, Our Revolution, which is a, a Sanders spinoff, you know, a bunch of groups like that. Like they, you know, they would, you know, it's not just about getting those votes. It's also about the time that is spent on organizing. But then after the election, it's about, you know, working to pressure in city councils. And so what I did see was mm. that in some of the suburbs around Boston, maybe not so much in Boston itself, but in suburbs, which, are, you know, and to be fair, suburbs that are pretty well known, usually for leaning pretty far left, like the People's Republic of Cambridge. <laughs> and, you know, but but I saw that like uh, the left was able to take, uh, you know, maybe like a third of the city council, you know, like kind of like a swing mm. block, not uh not the majority, but if um, the other third is like moderates and then there's a more hardline reactionary segment that is maybe smaller than the left, right? Then suddenly, regardless of who the mayor is, like you do have a lot of sort of sway there, right? And then that can mm. start affecting the budgets and the pace of things. And so I saw that... Um, the organizers uh, with the ACLU, uh, Cade Crockford, who I've known for a while, who's really good at this, all this stuff, you know, they worked very hard to get uh, facial recognition banned from the police forces and making it so that whenever the police have any kind of tracking technology that they order, it has to come up to the whole city council and it can't just quietly be ordered down off the radar, right? And I talked to one of those city councilors mm -hmm. who was not a DSA person uh, in one of those suburbs, but they were involved in this. And they said, yeah, you know, the city attorneys didn't want us to to do this thing, this ordinance banning facial recognition. And they said, we couldn't really do it, but we did it anyway. And then we did it. And the mayor was like, okay, all right, whatever. You know, and they got it through, right? And so, <laughs> and, and, then, and then after that, like, you know, um, one of the longtime state reps retires and then it's an open seat. And the left needs to look for open seats because those are always much easier to capture than incumbent challenges. And so then a DSA person gets in the state legislature. So there's a DSA in the state legislature. There's a chunk of, of DSA and, and and not just DSA, but like kind of friendly to that most of the time people. And like that's like, you know, and then suddenly you're like, OK, multiple levels are coming together here. And it's hard because Massachusetts is a really entrenched and corrupt state. So it's, it's tricky to uh, mm. break away from its style. But I would say that through that kind of tenacious organizing, you know, at those lower levels, because the problem you run into with elections is that, that um, mm. there isn't always like a good bench, right? There is, aren't always plausible candidates. Right. And a lot of times uh, corporate media will try to, snipe out and discredit people who seem to be a threat to the power structure because they're semi-credible, you know? And so again, so again, this is just my, you know, sort of personal take on all of this machinery, but, but you do see that as things shuffle, that there are avenues to it. And, and, and I think that on the far end of that is presidential elections, which are the hardest mm. to have an impact on as like individuals or at the city level or whatever. But if you can do types of organizing that then can also work in parallel with other levels, then it is possible to have more impact. So I'm not saying anyone should or shouldn't vote for anyone. I'm just kind of commenting on hmm. the fact that organizing at different types of levels, I have seen different things kind of play out and work in different ways. Yeah. Um, and I'm not in Minneapolis, so I haven't been up close to this, but, you know, we've seen a strong back and forth with, you know, whether or not, uh, the police department will be disbanded and turned into a public safety department. And they've been mm. trying to put that on the ballot as a, as a, as a municipal vote. And there's been a lot of back and forth in court. It seems like as of this week, it is going to get voted on in the municipal election, which has just started. Voting has just started. Early voting just started in Minneapolis in the last few days. So, uh, you know, again, that pressure, because there was such tension in Minneapolis, you know, yep. was resulting in a, a chunk of the city council being, you know, 
more open to reform. As one of my friends who is more of an insider was sort of putting it, a lot of doors opened after that uprising, doors that were not usually open. And so it is up to people to kind of like figure out how to deal with that and yep. sort of, um, you know, some people don't like to play that game. I definitely understand that. But, you know, power ebbs and flows and it's, a lot of it does come down to people trying to get to the table. So, so, you know, we'll see, we'll see how it shakes out. But what I see is that um, when the left does organize and not just to get people in office or to spend money on elections, but to, to try to have influence after the election and to try to be a constant presence, you know, or at the state legislature, you know, not just showing up once per legislative session, but being a consistent presence, contacting lots of people you know i got one friend of mine has tried so hard to work on legalizing marijuana legalizing cannabis in minnesota and chipping away at um stubborn legislators who don't support that you know patiently year after year you know and that's that's the slow burn right it's really hard to like work on that kind of slow politics but then you know, they start shipping things off and getting certain little reforms to the policy, getting put into omnibus bills and amendments and stuff like that. So, you know, that type of detail work and slow stuff is definitely not for everybody. And and it, and it doesn't necessarily work unless there's a larger environment that's like conducive to it. Um, but I do think that there's, there's a role for that type of thing in the overall landscape. Yeah. And I, so I have seen like the left move the ball at different levels, um, left reformers, people chipping away at stuff like war on drugs, you know, so um, or facial recognition, police policy, police budgets. Um, but but the national stuff is the hardest to reach. The local stuff is can be a lot easier to reach. And likewise, um, you know, to bring it back to media. And again, I'll just say. Like my opinions about, I'm not encouraging anyone to vote for or against anyone. Just wanted to comment on the lay of the land. But I would also say, you know, um, if you're not sure what to do, you can always try doing Freedom of Information Act requests. And if, mm. and, and try to be specific about what you're looking for. And there's a great website called Muck Rock, which helps facilitate doing uh, FOIA requests, uh, pretty much, I think, in, just in the United States. And uh, it will help you kind of write your uh, messages and sort of create online threads for you to sort of push the FOIAs. And that type of thing can honestly make a big difference because sometimes you just sort of take a moonshot, you just take a random shot at something and you end up with like the crown jewels showing huge influence networks and money and all this stuff. And, and Muckrock makes that easier. And And frankly, if uh, if a city or a county or sheriffs or whatever are being unreasonable and they're breaking the state law about what the deal is, a lot there are lawyers in every big city who will take that case on and file a lawsuit about it. And then the victory in the lawsuit will be you get your data and then those lawyers uh, basically get their hours paid for out of the lawsuit settlement so that um so they'll take it on for free and you don't have to pay them up front to do your FOIA lawsuit you can just like say like okay man let's try to do this and then you'll get your hours paid by the government at the end because we can win this one because we're actually in the right here and we can win it and i know people that have done succeeded in that pathway like quite a few times and gotten really key things out of the government so i think that uh in terms of media work, that style is it can be very successful and can work very well. So I mm. want to just mention that as an option. If you're not sure what else to do, you can definitely get somewhere with stuff like that. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, thanks. Yeah. Okay. I, I will amend my thoughts on electoralism by saying if, um, if you're going to do it, uh, be realistic and be strategic about it. That's good advice. That's also good to aim high. <laughs> yeah. 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 But, you know, like may, maybe the president is like a little too high and maybe you shouldn't put mm. all your eggs in one basket and they get really depressed when it doesn't pan out. Yeah. Anyway. Makes yeah, that's uh that that comes from a place of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um all right, well I think um I think this is kinda it. You wanna just like give like, I don't know, like top three things that like people who've listened to this should really check out. Sure. Well, Unicorn Riot, you know, we're, we're chugging along out there. Things are 
moving. We're developing some, you know, long form stuff, like I mentioned, that is slower to develop, but we're also doing, you know, shorter stories from places all over the world. So that's moving along. Uh, I, you know, and again, if people are interested in doing media work, you know, take a look at Muckrock to help you with your FOIAs. If you're a journalist, it's super helpful. And uh, if, mm -hmm. um, you know, another one that I mentioned, which had been sort of a source for us, uh, which is a, 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 a publishing collective called Distributed Denial of Secrets, which is independent from us, but they've, uh, you know, helped us point us to a bunch of different interesting stories. Yep. Uh, just this week, they have um, new stuff on um, this, this hosting company called Epic, which E-P-I-K, which hosts a lot of extreme, you know, proud boys, fascists, uh, really bad actors. And this Epic company keeps them alive, all those groups alive on the internet. And so um, some unknown third parties out there got Epic's data, probably through hacking or something, and then distributed denial of secrets. They, nev they never do the hacks, but people will give them data to say like, okay, here's the data. And so they do the publishing. They're you know publishers that work on that stuff. So I've just found that stuff fascinating. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're really on a roll with that kind of thing. And uh, so definitely want to mention that. Um, let's see, what's uh, those? Those are kind of the things that I've been keeping an eye on lately, which I think are really cool. Um, I just think that you know what, what I would mention in terms of publishing really quick. If people want to get in the game with their own stuff. It's important to run your own websites and then use social media. It's sort of a hub and spoke model and have good informative like landing pages. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I've done a lot of work with web development over the years. Uh, certainly, you know, WordPress is a decent option for people that are coming in new to this. Uh, another one that is used by a lot of media organizations is called Drupal. D-R-U-P-A-L. I will definitely give a plug for that. That's another free software package that's a very mature, mm -hmm. that's used a lot from higher end media publishing. So I do think that like there's a lot of machinery in terms of media publishing that I think uh, if you want the word out, don't just, don't just count on a Facebook page because Facebook will come and go in terms of what exposure it can give you. Try to get it out on the real internet in a real way uh, and, and then and then use all of those things like face tweets as secondary systems to your main website. I just want to kind of say that. So uh, yeah, that's I think that's my my best advice about publishing. And oh yeah, and then and if you're a nonprofit, use DonorBox because it helps a lot if you're trying to raise money for nonprofits. Yeah. All right. Thanks, man. Dan Felt. Uh, fight. Oh, jeez. <laughs>